I've been thinking of ways while listening and so on to kind of relate the two presentations because David's deals with the system and China's future and Mary's is really focused on one group, uh, China's workers and how labor policy has changed over time. I see a number of possible linkages and I'll try and raise some questions and, and maybe ask uh, Mary and David to reflect later on, on their conclusions of the other. But let me start at the outset. In reading David's uh, book, actually, and his presentation, listening to his presentation, I was reminded of, of Rick Baum's piece in China Quarterly in March 1996, when David was the editor, as I remember. Um, he used deductive logic and creative intuition to speculate on 10 potential, not four, but 10 potential scenarios uh, anticipating the death of Deng Xiaoping, which 1997, what will China do in the next three to five years? And in fact, he was bold enough to give odds for each of these, starting with neoconservatism, three to one, and the most outlying one was a neo-Maoist revival, 50 to one. Now, arguably, we have a combination of both, in a sense, today. Um, David doesn't give odds for his four potential outcomes. He does note, though, which ones are more likely. Um, also, I, I would note that some real congruence. David is not alone in, in what he's saying. If you look at uh, Hong Fang's new book, The China Boom, Why China Will Not Rule the World, Dan Lynch's book, China's Futures, um, they have somewhat similar kinds of arguments in a sense, in that Hong also notes the importance of political liberalization in addressing economic slowdown issues, dealing with the potential multiple social and environmental crises that would occur Dan Lynch, um, in his chapter on Chinese economists, the group that is most concerned uh, about the long-term problems of the China model, um, the economists suggest that, at a minimum, implicitly, that some sort of fundamental political change will be necessary if you want to have a more liberal economic order that will take root, flourish, and get out of the trap that China is in. Finally, before getting to the comparison of the papers, I found David's discussion uh, in his book of the Fang Shou political opening and tightening cycle in his chapter on China's polity in, in his book, China's Future, very interesting. He suggests the potential for a return to a political opening, which I found interesting, particularly in contrast to some of the other writings, um, including his own, in a sense, Wall Street Journal and elsewhere. Uh, Orville Shells, for example, even more pessimistic piece in the latest issue, April 21st, 2016, New York Review of Books, where he argues that we, in fact, have gone beyond these oscillating cycles of political relaxation and tightening. That's in the past. There's been a fundamental shift in ideological and organizational direction in China, beginning to inf influence China's reform agenda domestically as well as its foreign relations. And I found it very striking that people I used to think of as moderates uh, in the debate, not, this is not Gordon Chang we're talking about. These are moderate people like David and Orville have become so dispirited by the changes um, that have been going on in China. And David notes in his book, um, he has been critical in the past of Pei Min Xin's notion of the trap transition when it appeared in, in Pei Min Xin's book in 2006. And in fact, he wrote, David wrote a book on party adaptation, making it clear that he disagreed with that. But after the changes in 2009, he now sees that Pei actually may have had something there. It's much more persuasive that China is, in a sense, a developmental autocracy in which the economic foundation is inevitably constrained by its political superstructure. By the way, David's book is, is uh, and I have a copy with me if anyone wants to see what it looks like, but, um, but, but David's uh, book is dedicated to Harry Harding, which I found particularly interesting uh, for reasons beyond his reasons for dedicating it, because Harry is one of the last people really to deal with these big issues uh, how do we see the overall Chinese political system? Okay, now let me try and relate the two presentations. One similarity I, I, I would see, and this is typical of the work of both David and Mary, is that they are explicitly comparative. This comes through in David's book, it comes through in Mary's article in Daedalus from 2014, um, where she placed the China case in a comparative context. Actually, I should say, should say in my graduate seminar on China, which met on Monday night, just so happens I was using Mary's 2002 World Politics article, Why China's Economic Reforms Have Delayed Democracy, which I th still think is very relevant, looking at China in comparison to Eastern Europe and Russia in terms of foreign direct investment and ownership diversification, 
Uh, and also looking at China in comparison to South Korea and Taiwan in terms of FDI integration into the global economy. Um, so she's always been very comparative. In David's case, five minutes, okay. Um, in David's case, he looks at the insights from modernization theory in terms of the middle income trap in newly industrializing economies. He looks at comparative, com comparative communism theories on late stage Leninist regimes, pointing out, I think accurately, that China is not immune to the problems of their polities and economies they face. It's not exceptional in the sense that, that some people have argued in terms of China scholarship. Um, a second possible similar, similarity, I think, might be the discussion of the lessons learned and not learned from the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union in, in Eastern Europe. And in his book, David does a very good job, I think, of contrasting the very different lessons learned by the conservatives and the political reformers from the policies of Gorbachev and their results. A difference that will have, a, as it's worked out, will have a great deal to do with determining China's future path. Uh, for Mary, I find her comment that the CCP is still finding the specter of solidarity, which comes out in, in the Daedalus article, the Polish labor movement, even though, as she points out, solidarity, the so-called Polish disease, the solidarity in the post-revolutionary period was willing to pursue market reforms and undermine the power of labor. But the Chinese, as Mary notes, have a continuing fear of autonomous labor. So I was wondering, in a similar manner to David's analysis, whether there were also debates within the CCP on how to understand the example of solidarity and other label movements in Eastern Europe in light of post-revolutionary developments. Third point of comparison in the two presentations might be the question of periodization. David's very clear in delineating five periods from 1985 to 2015 with soft authoritarianism from 1998 to 2008. Mary, on the other hand, is less explicit about periodization in terms of characterizing the different periods, but the, she does note that the first labor law in PRC history came in 1994 when China was in a hard authoritarianism mode in David's periodization. The 1998 to 2008 period of soft authoritarian, authoritarianism, which is actually good in, in David's analysis, also included the 1998 to 2001 restructuring of the public sectors when over 30 million public sector workers lost their jobs. In 2005, and I'm getting this from Mary, I'm not making it up, <laughs> I didn't do my own research on this. In 2005, 35 percent of urban workers were employed informally, not formally. 90 percent of migrant workers worked without a labor contract. Um, 2008 is also an important year for Mary because of the new labor laws. Uh, but it, as she pointed out just now, it led to an immense increase in labor conflict, compelling the government to take a more interventionist stance to handle collective disputes, given the concern with local stability and the weak legal system's inability to enforce judgments. Since Mary sees the government's reluctance to create institutions as one reason why China is caught in an instability trap, that instability, in fact, as she says, is built into the system, my sense is that she would likely agree with David that the current system is unsustainable. But I'd be interested in hearing whether she thinks that's indeed the case, and whether David's periodization of regime type on what is good for China's future is also good for the future of China's workers, given the costs and you could argue it's only short-term and necessary costs that have to be paid. But um, given the cost of this restructuring, um, this soft authoritarianism uh, model that David is recommending, in other words, does Mary see the 1998 to 2008 period as favorably as David does when it comes to China's workers? <laughs> 